Uh, Patriots History of the United States, Chapter 17, Part 12. Ground Zero. On July 16, 1945, at a desolate spot 160 miles from Los Alamos, New Mexico, the United States tested a weapon that would make even the most hardened and suicidal Japanese leaders change their minds. The device, referred to by the Los Alamos technicians as the gadget, and never as an atomic bomb, represented an astounding technological leap and an acceleration of the normal peacetime process needed to do the job by a factor of three, compressing some 15 to 20 years of work into five. Yet, the test was only that, a test. No bomb was actually dropped. Instead, a device sitting atop a huge tower in the New Mexico desert was detonated through cables and wires from bunkers thousands of yards away. Few, however, were prepared for the fantastic destructive power released at the Trinity bomb site on July 16th. A fireball with temperatures four times the heat of the sun's center produced a cloud that reached 38,000 feet into the sky while simultaneously turning the sand below into glass. The cloud was followed by a shock wave that shattered windows 200 miles away and hurricane strength winds carrying deadly radioactive dust, the dangers of which few perceived at the time. Brigadier General Thomas Farrell reported that the air blast that came after the fireball was followed almost immediately by the strong, sustained, awesome roar which warned of doomsday and made us feel that we were puny things, were blasphemous to dare tamper with the forces heretofore reserved to the Almighty. All along, the U.S. government had intended to use the weapon as soon as it became available on any of the Axis powers still in the war. Truman said he regarded the bomb as a military weapon and never had any doubt that it should be used. Nor did he find the actual decision to use the bomb difficult. The former artillery major recalled that giving authority to use the atomic bomb was no great decision, not any decision you had to worry about, but rather called the bomb merely another powerful weapon in the arsenal of righteousness. Thus, both the condition and the attitude of Japan in late July as the invasion and the bombs were being readied remains the key issue in determining how necessary the use of the bomb was. At the same time, the American public had started to expect some of the troops in Europe to come home, forcing the Army to adopt a point system based on soldiers' length of service, military honors, and participation in campaigns. The perverse effect of this was that for the first time in their Army careers, the officers and men became seriously concerned with medals. Having defeated the Germans, few servicemen wanted to be transferred to fight the Japanese, which was increasingly likely prospect. Regardless of the fact that Japan had launched no new offensives, their capability to resist a large-scale invasion with bloody results still remained. No one doubts that in the absence of the bombs, an invasion would have occurred. Instead, liberal critics challenged the casualty estimates of the American planners. Based on Japan's remaining military forces and using Iwo Jima and Okinawa casualty rates as a barometer, strategists concluded that between 100,000 and 1 million American soldiers and sailors would die in a full-scale invasion. In addition, using as a guide the civilian casualties at Manila, Okinawa, and other densely populated areas that the U.S. had reconquered during the war, the number of Japanese civilians expected to die in such an invasion were put at between 1 and 9 million. Critics charged that these numbers represented only the highest initial estimates and that expected casualty rates were scaled down. In fact, however, the estimates were probably low. The figures only included ground-based casualties, not total expected losses to such deadly weapons as kamikazes. Moreover, the Joint Chiefs of Staff considered its estimates, at best, only educated guesses, and that the projections of Japanese resistance severely underestimate the number of Japanese troops. 
Equally distressing, intercepts of Japanese secret documents revealed that Japan had concentrated all of its troops near the southern beaches, the location where the invasion was planned to begin. This proved particularly troubling because the first round of casualty guesses in June was based on the anticipation that Japanese forces would be dispersed. Indeed, there were probably far more than 350,000 Japanese troops in the southern part of Kyushu, a fact that could yield at least 900,000 American combat casualties. Other models used for estimates produced even more sobering predictions of the Japanese resistance. At Tarawa, of 2,571 enemy soldiers on the island when the U.S. Marines landed, only eight men were captured alive, indicating a shocking casualty rate of 99.7%. And in the Aleutians, only 29 out of 2,350 surrendered, for a fatality rate of 98.8. Worse, in Saipan, hundreds of civilians refused to surrender. Marines watched whole families wade into the ocean to drown together or huddle around grenades. Parents tossed their children off cliffs before leaping to join them in death. It seems clear then that no matter which estimates are employed, more than a million soldiers and civilians at least would die in an invasion under even the rosiest scenarios. If the bomb could save lives in the end, the morality of dropping it was clear. Perhaps more importantly than the what-ifs, the Japanese reaction provides sobering testimony of the bomb's value, because even after the first bomb fell, the Japanese made no effort whatsoever to surrender. Recent research in classified Japanese governmental documents confirms the wisdom of Truman's decision. Historian Sadeo Asada agrees that it was most likely the atomic bomb that finally overcame the warlord's tenacious and suicidal opposition to surrender. Asada concludes from post-war memoranda left by the inner councils that the atomic bombing was crucial in accelerating the peace process. Although some hardliners were also concerned about the possibility of a concurrent Soviet U.S. invasion, that fear merely served as the coup de grace. The memoirs of the deputy chief of the Army General Staff confirmed this when he noted, there is nothing we can do about the atomic bomb that nullifies everything. Truman never had the slightest hesitation about using the bomb, leaving left-wing scholars to scour his memoirs and letters for even the slightest evidence of second thoughts. He promptly gave his approval as soon as the Trinity test proved successful. Moreover, Truman planned to drop the existing bombs in a fairly rapid sequence if the warlords did not surrender, in order to convince Japan that America had a plentiful supply. On August 6, 1945, two B-29s flew over Hiroshima, one of them a reconnaissance photo plane, another the Enola Gay, under the command of Colonel Paul Tibbets, which carried the atomic bomb. American aircraft two days earlier had dropped three quarters of a million warning leaves informing citizens of Hiroshima that the city would be obliterated. But few Japanese had heeded the message. Rumors that Truman's mother had once lived nearby or that the United States planned to make the city an occupation center or just plain stubbornness contributed to the fatal decision of most inhabitants to remain. Tibbet's payload produced an explosion about the size of 20,000 tons of TNT, or about three times the size of the August fire raid, when 820 B-29 bombs had dropped 6,600 tons of TNT on several cities. More than 66,000 people in Hiroshima died instantly, or soon after the explosion. Some 80,000 more were injured and another 300,000 were exposed to radiation. The Japanese government reacted by calling in its own top atomic scientist, Dr. Yoshia Nishina, inquiring whether Japan could make such a weapon in a short period. Clearly, this was not the response of a defeated nation seeking an end to hostilities. After nothing but a deafening silence had emanated from Tokyo, Truman ordered the second bomb be dropped. 
On August 9th, Nagasaki, an alternative target to Kokuro, was hit. The B-29 pilot ordered to strike a clear target had to abandon munition-rich Kokuro because of cloud conditions. The deadly results were similar to those in Hiroshima, nearly 75,000 dead. Nagasaki, too, was stocked with war plants of death, which included an ammunition factory and steel plants, according to the American correspondent George Weller, who defied MacArthur's order against traveling there. After Nagasaki, Japanese officials cabled the message that they accepted in principle the terms of unconditional surrender. Still, that cable did not itself constitute a surrender. Truman halted atomic warfare, an act that in itself was a bluff since the United States had no more bombs immediately ready. But conventional raids continued while the Japanese officials argued heatedly about their course of action. Indeed, for a brief time on August 10th, even though no Japanese reply had surfaced, Marshall ordered a halt to the strategic bombing. On August 14th, the Japanese cabinet was still divided over the prospect of surrender with the war minister and members of the chiefs of staff still opposing it. Only when that gridlock prevented the decision did the new prime minister, Kentaro Suzuki, ask Emperor Hirohito to intervene. By Japanese tradition, he had to remain silent until that moment, but allowed to speak, he quickly sided with those favoring surrender. Hirohito's decision, broadcast on radio, was an amazing occurrence. Most Japanese people had never before heard the voice of their god, so to lessen the trauma, the emperor had recorded the message, instructing his citizens that they had to endure the unendurable and allow American occupation, because the only alternative was the total extinction of human civilization. Even then, aides worried that militarists would attempt to assassinate him before he could record the message. He told his subjects, The time has come when we must bear the unbearable. I swallow my own tears and give my sanction to the proposal to accept the Allied proclamation. Even in defeat, however, the Emperor's comments gave insight into the nature of the Japanese thinking that had started the war in the first place. The massacre of 200,000 Chinese at Nanking apparently did not count when it came to human civilization. Only Japanese did. American commanders ordered their forces to cease fire on August 15th, and on September 2nd, aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, along with representatives of the other Allied powers in the Pacific, accepted the Japanese surrender. American planes blackened the sky above, and most of the ships in the Pacific fleet sailed by in a massive display of might. As one veteran at the ceremonies observed, we want to make sure they know who won the war. Certainly the emperor knew, for on January 1st, 1946, he had to issue a statement denying that he was the incarnate deity. Most Americans seemed undisturbed by the use of atomic weapons to end the war, far from causing nuclear nightmares, as activists like to imply later. Some 65% of Gallup poll respondents claimed they were not concerned about the bomb or its implications. Truman remained unmoved in his view that the bomb's use was thoroughly justified. When the head of the Atomic Bomb Project, J. Robert Oppenheimer, commented to Truman that some of the scientists felt like they had blood on their hands, Truman offered him a handkerchief and said, Well, here, would you like to wipe off your hands? Years later, when a crew filming a documentary on Hiroshima asked Truman if he would consider a pilgrimage to Ground Zero, he caustically responded, I'll go to Japan if that's what you want, but I won't kiss their ass. In retrospect, three central reasons justified the dropping of the atomic bombs. First and most important, the invasion of Japan would cost American lives, up to a million, perhaps far more. The interests of the United States demanded that the government do everything in its power to see that not one more American soldier or sailor died than was absolutely necessary, and the atomic bombs ensured the result. Second, Japan would not surrender, nor did its leaders give any indication whatsoever that they would surrender short of annihilation. 
One can engage in hypothetical discussions about possible intentions, but public statements such as the fight to the bitter end comment and the summing of Japan's top atomic scientists after the Hiroshima bomb was dropped demonstrate rather conclusively that the empire planned to fight on. Third, the depredations of the Japanese equal those of the Nazi. The Allies, therefore, were justified in nothing less than unconditional surrender and a complete dismantling of the samurai Bushido as a requirement for peace. Only in the aftermath, when the prisoner of war camps were opened, did it become apparent that the Japanese regime had been every bit as brutal as the Nazi, if less focused on particular groups. Thousands of prisoners died working in the Siam Railway, and field commanders had working instructions to kill any prisoners incapable of labor. Guards routinely forced fistfuls of rice down prisoners' throats, then filled them with water, then, as their stomachs swelled, punched or kicked the men's bellies. Almost five times as many Anglo-American POWs died in Japanese hands as in the Nazi camps, which reflected almost benign treatment in comparison to what Chinese and other Asians received at the hands of the Japanese. As with the Nazi, such horrors illustrated not only individuals' capacity for evil, but more important, they also illustrated the nature of the brutal system that had produced a view of non-Japanese as subhumans. At the same time, Japan's fanaticism led to a paralysis of government that prevented the nation from surrendering. The outcome of the war, evident after Midway, was probably decided even before. In February 1942, advisors had told the emperor that Japan could not possibly win. Human suicide bombers were used in 1944 with no end of the war in sight. While Japan was liberated in a different way than, say, France, its peoples were no less subjects to a domineering worldview that enslaved them. A post-war Japanese cartoonist depicted his shackles being cut by U.S. force scissors, with his caption reading, We must not forget that we did not shed a drop of blood or raise a sweat to cut those chains. MacArthur's scrubbing of Japanese ultranationalism was so thorough, the educational reform so deep, that Theodore Giselle, Dr. Seuss, visiting Japan in 1953, asked students to draw pictures of what they wanted to be when they grew up. They received hundreds of pictures of doctors, teachers, statesmen, even wrestlers, but only one picture of a soldier. One Japanese child wanted to be General Douglas MacArthur. And we will start on Chapter 18 in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd really love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.